Welcome to All Over the Map. Take chances and ask questions. Open discussion on all topics. The driving force. Get her done. Laughter is medicine for the soul. It's a small world after all. Now with it is over. Across the line, another mini two-on-one. Metropolitan can't do anything with it. Now it is he scores! Picked up his own rebound. Metropolitan makes it 2-1. We'd like to welcome Glenn Metropolit, Metro, to all over the map. A native of Toronto, Ontario, Metropolit was never drafted by an OHL or NHL team, yet managed a 10-year NHL career and 407 games played. After a GTHL career mostly in AA hockey, Metropolit played two seasons for the Richmond Hill Riots Junior B Hockey Club, OHA, before heading west to play for the Vernon Lakers of the British Columbia Junior Hockey League. But it's the man behind the hockey that I care about the most. This is the true story how Glenn Metropolit, Metro, turned all his adversities and converted them into victories. Welcome, brother man, to All Over the Map. Now, this is truly the rocky story of hockey, Glenn Metropolit. All right, so this is your chance to tell your story to the world of true perseverance and an unwavering commitment to the definition of never give up. Let's start with your childhood, my friend. Growing up in the projects of Regent Park, which has been described by a local newspaper, is living there is like getting kicked in the teeth. Well, I guess that pretty well sums it up. Uh, not a not the kind of upbringing a regular hockey player kind of went through, I guess. Um, that being said, you know, drug infested, uh, prostitution, uh, crime. Um, it's kind of the area that I grew up in, Regent Park. Um, but it was a great childhood. Had, had lots of good friends. Uh, we all, the good kids played hockey, so to speak, and the other ones got off track and um, they picked the tough road. So um, it is what it was. And that's, that's where we, that's got us where we are now. So it's close to Scarborough, right? Yeah. Just, uh, yeah, basically Scarborough. Then you got Scarborough, East York, yeah. downtown. Um, yeah. But I was, uh, I was right in the middle of the, the heavy stuff. So. Right in the middle of the circus, eh? Yeah, pretty much, man. Yeah. Um, but as a kid growing up, right, you don't know any You know any better. That's the thing, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had the best childhood. All, all of my buddies, we all had just single parents, you know, trying to control us kids, you know, misguided youth. And we were just running a road. So we had a blast doing it, but there's no way uh, I'd recommend raising a kid that way. <laughs> oh, boy. Right from it, you know, it taught me uh, some strength, so. So humble beginnings. Um, let's talk about your uh, your road to achieving your dreams, Mets. Yeah. Well, I have so many people that that, that was part of my journey. You know, um, where do I start? Really, um, you kind of you, you start in a just playing ball hockey with everyone, and then basically you're at the parks and parks and recreation centers, mm -hmm. and then you're playing. Um, wherever you could play just to stay happy. Basically, that's kind of was my, it was my escape. Basically hockey um, was my happiness, getting away from the house, you know, all, all the stuff that was, all the noise that was in my life. Outside well, I, the that's the thing, you know, you talk about the whole, like when I say Rocky story of hockey, it's like you didn't take the, the standard route, so to speak, you know, uh, not playing organized hockey to the age of 12, um, you know, hockey gear being handed down to you. Uh, you know, not having, you know, the, the privilege, obviously, to, you know, be supported by, you know, uh, you know, new hockey gear, all that kind of stuff that, you know, a lot of kids uh, nowadays, I mean, I think it's like 10 grand a year to put a kid through hockey. It's, it's, yeah. it's insanity, you know, yeah, so I it's, I wouldn't be able to play. I, I was fortunate enough to have the rinks to play on that the, the city took care of. And then Regent Park, we also had our own indoor ice rink called Moss Park. That's kind of where I started off. It was a free league. And, you know, quite frankly, my mom didn't, you know, we didn't have the money to play in those leagues. So I did all my hockey outside. And whenever I did play in the leagues, I got all the equipment, like you're saying, from the hand-me-downs, from my teammates that, you know, their feet got too big. So they gave me their old skates with that much steel to skate. <laughs> so 
I, I always felt bad for my brother because my brother always got my hand me downs. He's like, why does Ryan always get the right? So, but it, yeah. it's, it's a sport, right? That's why you, uh, the, the, the road I came up, it would be hard to see any kids coming up from there. That's for sure. Yeah. So I know Glenn, the person has always treated people and everybody with respect. Uh, who was it that instilled the core values into you uh, growing up as a person? I have to go with uh, my mom. You know, my mom's been always there for me. And um, so I was saying to you earlier to um, the parks and recreation people that actually were there for you after school, you know, those were the ones that were my mentors kind of teaching you the right path, you know, stay straight and, you know, keep chasing your goals type thing. But my mom showed me strength and um, always being there for me. Yeah. So, I mean, being around that environment, obviously we're a byproduct of our environment in many cases. You know, they say that's an old saying, we're the sub and substance of the five people we associate ourselves with the most. Um, you know, it all comes down to choices. Um, there was obviously many choices for you to go the other way and, you know, start using drugs and, you know, get into the booze or, you know, the crime and uh, play into that, you know, whole demographics of life. Uh, but you choose to, you chose to stay focused and, uh, you know, um, I mean, that's a lot that's, of, uh, there's a know. lot of distractions, a lot of, uh, stuff that can take you away from your, your goals, your dreams. But, um, I guess I, I just, I was in so in love with hockey and that kind of kept me, that kept my dream alive, you know, just playing hockey. And, um, unfortunately there were so many better hockey players than I, than I was growing up, you know, that maybe I had a little bit more support in regards to a couple more family members that, actually helped me out through hockey, you know, than that other kid. But um, it's unfortunate that we, we all didn't get the same support. But, you know, it's, you know, it's part of my journey. And some of those guys aren't even alive anymore because they chose that other route. You know, they didn't know any different. So, um, And then so, you know, uh, you, 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 12 years old, organized hockey, and then you started playing junior B at, uh, it was at 16 or 17? I started playing uh, 17, 16, 17, uh, playing high school hockey, which wasn't much, you know what I mean? But my a good childhood friend, Jeff Wilson, he was playing in uh, with the Toronto Red Wings, Young Nationals, uh, you know, Kevin Weeks, um, Mike Johnson. They're all in those leagues, but I never had the money and I couldn't get transportation to those, those rinks anyway, right? Because I was taking a subway wherever I got to play hockey, streetcar, buses. Um, but he was the... He was really the um, – he was the main guy going into a new team in junior B. He was like, oh, why don't you come and uh, try out? I'm like, well, okay, I'll give it a try. Deep down inside, I knew I was as good as him, you know, but I was just so raw. I was the last cut on that team and um, kind of rest is history, you know. Played two years in Richmond Hill, had great years. And then finally I got to an age where, you know, growing up in the University of Toronto, I turned 19, you can go to the bars now. My buddies quit hockey. They're starting to do other stuff, smoking weed. And I just, I stay focused, you know, in regards for hockey. And I, I knew Toronto wasn't a place for me to stay. So I had an opportunity to go to Vernon. That's where I met you that year. And um, <laughs> Rob Bremner found me out in, uh, in Guelph. There was some super camp going on in Guelph. And uh, I went there and uh, he discovered me. And he said, why don't you come out, come out to Vernon, get your life straightened out, work hard at school. And uh, I think you'll have a good year. And, you know, I had a pretty good year out there and got recruited and, you know, signed a letter of intent with Bowling Green. Uh, I tell you, I, I was a bit of a journeyman suitcase after having some adversity. My first year, I was so scared to go to the rink uh, for uh, all the rookie initiations and hazing. But when I came to Verdun and I met you, I, I, def I was like, this guy's a beauty. I was like, definitely. Glenn Metropolis is probably one of the funniest, most real, authentic guys that I ever played with in my life. And, uh, you know, to be able to talk to you right now and, you know, at this stage of our evolution and our development, you know, and just to see what you're doing now and as a person, I know your heart, man, it's always been so big and, you know, I'm, I'm full of gratitude just not, you know, to just not only just to have you on the show, but to call you my friend and my brother. And, uh, that means so much to me. Well, thanks. Sir. I'm happy to be on your show, bud. It's, uh, it's great to reconnect with you. Yeah, buddy. Obviously, the, the hockey world's a small world, so. It's a small world after all. Yeah, you're doing a great job, man. You, you know, I got to play with the last couple of guests you had there, George LaRock and Riley. Um, 
It's good, man. You're doing good work. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Two good guys. Uh, you know, that's, uh, we pride ourselves uh, on this platform to have uh, good people with a good message, you know, and it's all about community and unity at the end of the day. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you played uh, hockey, it doesn't matter if you played squash or tennis, it doesn't matter if you work at Save On Foods. If you got a good message and it's all about giving back and helping others and passing it on and paying it forward, um, you know, that's what we stand for is, uh, you know, just giving people opportunities and trying to create those opportunities for people that are, you know, have less or, you know, um, such as, you know, people like yourself, you know, coming from those humble beginnings that, you know, there's, uh, you know, you could have gone one way, but you went the other and look where you ended up. And that's something to be like, so proud of, man. You know, I'm, I remember watching, I, I guess, you know, I told you before, even you know, having phone discussions, uh, when I saw you play that first NHL game, I remember where I was, you know, being half in the bag for crying out loud and seeing Metropolit on the back of a Capitals jersey. I was like, yes, he made it. He's there. And, uh, you know, someone who truly deserved it. And, uh, you know, you're the epitome of, the ne of never give up to me. And uh, that's how I really try to live my life is, you know, um, you know, I went through my stuff, you know, at a younger age, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things as you get older, you realize what's really important in life. And, uh, you know, you had to keep moving forward or you take step, step, steps back. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, you're one guy that uh, has that never give up attitude and uh, it's not leaving you anytime soon. Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, you look at the hockey career, right? You start out in East Coast Hockey League, the IHL, then finally get your chance at NHL and kind of banged around a little bit. So, yeah, I've been blessed too. So. And so how many NHL teams did you play for? Was it like 10? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm eight, kidding. I mean, I was with the uh, St. Louis Blues for 22 games, then went to the Bruins. Yeah, but, uh, you know, start off with Washington – First NHL team, and then my uh, next one after that came back was um, the Atlanta Thrashers, St. Louis Blues for a little bit. Then I went to Boston, uh, Philly, Montreal. Who, where was your uh, favorite place to play? Um, I, I want to say, I mean, anywhere in NHL is amazing, obviously, but uh, Boston was a great sports town. Boston, yeah. Montreal, you know, original six teams. You know, you can't beat those places. That's um, amazing. You got to play for two original six teams, Beantown and Monty. I mean, that must have been killer. I mean, yeah. what was yeah. it like actually stepping on the ice at the Bell Center with like 23,000 fans just going crazy? I mean, I, I've watched games there before, man, and it's there's nothing like it. I mean, it's just – it's a religion, you know. Yeah, the, thing there, though, the, the fans are so uh, – they're, they're so they, – they know so much about hockey or they're not booing you or whatever. They just – they know good hockey and they kind of, they, they really appreciate the game there. Montreal is unbelievable. We, especially when we had that run, you know, in 2010, we made the conference finals there. Yeah. We'd win a series. We'd fly back. We won two game sevens on a road. We'd fly back and cop cars are on fire. They're riding. I mean, they just loved, the, they loved hockey. They loved us winning. So um, quite, quite an experience living in that kind of sports town. Yeah. A lot of pressure too, I bet, eh? Not so much for me, you know, being a third line guy, you know, but you know, that the big guys have, you know, making a big money for not performing, man, they get on you. That's for sure. Um, I was kind of like the underdog where um, they didn't really expect much out of me, but I kind of gave them more than expected. So they, they really took to me, you know, so um, it was great, but it was hard on like a Scotty Gomez at times, you know, they kind of had like a, he had a special clock on when he's going to score the next goal. He went like 82 games without a goal. I remember that season. I was like, this poor guy is taking more slack than I mean. It, it was tough on him, but that's it comes with it, man. It comes with the territory. Uh, that's that's what the boys signed up for, eh? Yeah. Well, and then got signed for. <laughs> right. yeah. So um you played 22 years of pro hockey. How did all those games and travel take a toll on not only your mind? and your body, but your spirit as well. You, I mean, you gave your heart to the game of hockey, you know, all the blood and the sweat and the tears that all on the way. I mean, tell me a little bit about that. I mean, that's a long journey, man. A lot of games, a lot of travel. I mean, God, it's just, uh, you know, let's hear a little bit about that. I mean, yeah, it's uh, where do I start again? 22 years, you know, I, I can start my journey where uh, my first year, first year pro, you know, I kind of, I, 
go back to Vernon. I didn't get the scholarship. I had to be red shirted. Um, so I said, I'm going to turn pro. So I Which is a Troy. blessing. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. So I called Troy Mick, our assistant coach at the time. Yeah. Uh, Vernon and, uh, Mick got me, yeah, Micker. He got me a tryout with uh, that that Landon Knights at the time in the IHL, and their affiliate was East Coast Hockey League team uh, Nashville. Mm-hmm. And so I got cut right away in Atlanta. Got sent down to Nashville, and um, that's where the journey kind of started. Where I remember my first trip, I was a healthy scratch for the first ten games, and we had a couple extra guys on a bus trip. We went down to Tallahassee to play against the Tiger Sharks, and. Um, everyone's sleeping in the aisles and have bunks because they're going to be able to play. So they need somewhere to sleep. And I, I had to sleep at the front of the bus on the stairs and the driver's name was snake. He had like a scorpions cut off sleeve leather jacket. You know, I, wish, I thought he was going to die at the wheel while we're driving down in Tallahassee. How old this guy was. I, he had so many years on him, but um, so it started there and then basically went on to um, the next summer, went and played roller hockey Try to make some extra money, you know, to kind of survive. And um, after that, we got- opted out on landscaping and decided to play roller hockey. Yeah, I had the summer job. I did landscape. I wanted to kind of just work out hard in the summer. And and then finally, I got a chance to, you know, I was, I was actually sleeping at my uncle's house. Yeah. Underneath the, he made me like a little makeshift room underneath the stairs by the, by the water boiler. And I remember just sweating my balls off in there every night. And I was like, fuck this. I'm getting out of here. I'm going to play roller hockey. So I went and played roller hockey for that summer in Long Island. And, um, got, uh, I went to Pensacola ice pilots the next year, uh, Quebec Raphael's. They kind of switched Nashville nights, went to uh, Pensacola, you know, um, Atlanta went to Quebec. So played about 22 games up in the IHL and 60 and I'm, you know, Pensacola and, um, had a great year there. And then uh, went to Grand Rapids for two years in the IHL and basically got my sniff. We got my chance with the Washington Capitals. That kind of started my NHL journey, I guess. What was that first NHL game like? How'd you feel? Um, surreal. It was a dream, right? Finally kind of accomplished what I've always dreamt of as a kid. The dream had come into fruition. Yeah, pretty much. But I was remember, I remember just being scared shitless, really. Yeah. And trying to fight the nerves and trying to be able to, you know, don't pinch myself. Like just kind of just stay in a moment and play hard. Cause I had a great camp. Um, I was on starting lineup national anthem down in Florida against the Panthers. And I lined up against Pavel Burry and my line mates were Adam Oates and Peter Bondra. And it was. Burry had, wasn't a bad skater. No, he's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, what was his nickname? The Russian. The Russian Rock? Rock. I remember seeing him uh, play at the Pacific Coliseum. It was his second year. I remember like literally uh, the first year I was away uh, playing hockey in Kelowna. My first year was 1991. So I never got to see him play live, but I got to see him play live the second year. And he literally would bring people out of the seat. Like yeah. it was so good. I mean, that guy in today's game would be incredible. I mean, yeah. this, I mean, I think he had a hundred and, 10 points or something like that his best year. But like, if you put him in today's game, you know, with, uh, with you know, he played in the clutch and grab era when there was just, uh, it was a little tougher back then. You too. Um, I mean, in today's game is so skilled, you know, like there's, you know, all, all the, the fighting's not as much, you know, there's not as much, you know, they're fast as heck. I mean, these kids are so skilled. It's unbelievable. So skilled, so skilled, so fast, so strong. They're bigger now. Yeah. It's amazing to watch the, the, evolution of the game you know it's uh and it leads me to kind of what i'm doing now you know i'm doing player development down here in tampa so but um yeah part of the journey four years much uh with the capitals up and down portland maine great city my my first uh, daughter was born there olivia and um i did four years four years up and down and finally it was like i can't do this no more you know i had to kind of i asked for a trade and they said uh, you know you're such an asset we we're not just gonna give you away so I had to make a decision to go over to Europe and I went over to Jokerit in Finland, Helsinki, beautiful, organic. What a, what a country, great people, great hockey for such a small country. Um, had two good years there and then uh, went to Lugano, Switzerland, won a championship in Lugano, MVP of the league and went to world championships with team Canada. And that's kind of where I talked to Don Waddell and I got a contract with Atlanta, uh, Atlanta Thrashers. Nice. Is that where you went? Uh, Robbie, Robbie Shrimp. Shrimp, yeah, I didn't play against Robbie there. He wasn't on my team there, but okay. 
played against him, you know, off and on different leagues, but you know, hockey, hockey world small, great man. Yeah, he is awesome. very humble. Yeah. We had him on the, he was our first guest on the show. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. It was, uh, yeah. I can say Robbie is just, uh, you know, not as he, he's a great friend and, uh, he, but he's a really what good off, person. Right? Well, we, oh know, my God. He, yeah, he had 145 points in 57 games in the OHL. Uh, I mean, 57 goals, 145 points. Are you kidding me? I mean, that guy, if he was given a little bit more of a chance, um, I think that, I mean, he yeah. would have had a long NHL career, but uh, you know, th things happen and uh, everything leads you to where you are today. And he's doing some really good stuff with, uh, with vision 44. Yeah. And uh, I think you're a part of that as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of the coaches on there, the virtual coaches. Yeah, um, that's great. Dabbling into it, he's 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 got such a great thing going, man. Yeah, I'm learning from him, even though I'm older. You know, whenever I talk to him, he's he's got so, so much wealth of knowledge. He really does. I talked to him yesterday. It's like every time I talk to him on the phone, I feel like I get I really get something good out of that conversation. Yeah. Like he actually really takes time to listen. You know, like other people just take time to hear. And they just not really like listen to what you have to say. But like when him and I have those have conversations, it's like, I feel like I get, I, I'm coming out of a counseling session. <laughs> the, the, the jumbo good. shrimp. Yeah, he's, he's one of the good guys. So. He's a good egg. Absolutely. So in my mind, uh, you were one of the most talented players that I ever played with and against um having the opportunity uh to you know obviously uh not play a lot of minutes when you're playing in the nhl um you know i thought you deserve a lot more ice time to be honest with you um how did that affect you and you know were you just grateful to have the opportunity as most canadian kids uh do when they play in the nhl well that, that's basically it when i first got in the nhl in 99 it was more or less the clutch and grab don't make mistakes so i never really got to be a my true self at that level, even though it was the best players in the world. I always just played like not to make a mistake. So, you know, I'd be skate to center line, chip it in, go, you know, make contact, you know, create, create a, you know, stall a puck and do, do some work down low. But um, it's, uh, it was all about trying to adjust and finding your role on each team. Right. Even though I was a skilled guy, I had to be a penalty killer too. So whatever you needed, you know, that's, that's part of it, man, to make, because everyone's been on the power play, doesn't matter if it's the toughest guy there. When they were playing junior hockey, they're they're on power play. They're always the top guys. So it's um it's it's the world of the best players. So it was just adjust to whatever the team needed you to be and be the best you could be. Because you know someone's below you trying to get your job. Absolutely. That's how that goes. Yeah. So, so um and that goes to the point too, where we're talking about the mental health and all that, the concussions. I mean, I've gotten knocked out cold or I don't remember where I was, but it was like, you're not keeping me out of the lineup too long. Cause I, I'm not going to lose my spot, you know? So I'd, I'd rush myself back and maybe the, it's all catching up to me now. You know what I mean? Maybe the, the, you know, just the way I'm, I'm wired now, you know, it's going through some depression parts and kind of, yeah. Just, I'm glad no. that you can be open about this. You know, I think there's a lot of people out there these days, uh, uh, especially hockey players uh, that have ha taken so much trauma. I mean, it's like, you know, you go in a war every night, literally it's like gladiator. It's like, you know, going back to Roman civilization, you go into an arena, you know, you got these screaming fans that are seeing all the glitz and glamor, you know, guys are knocking each other's heads off here and there. Not as much anymore, but I mean, when a guy gets hit now too, they're flying at a, you know, they're, they're, they're the Kevlar pads and everything, taking those knocks to, I mean, we got neurotransmitters in our, in our gut for crying out loud. So every time your body's getting hit, you know, there's an impact obviously that's, you know, it's, it's shaking up either the melon or whatever. I mean, it's uh, the, the body takes on a lot of trauma. Yeah. Let's even rewind though to our leagues. I'm uh, playing three games in three nights and, you, you got back in the day, you had the, the tough guys that are running, you know, elbowing you in the head, take, you got to take it and better refereeing as you go up the levels too. Right. So the refereeing's not as good as the minors because everyone's trying to work their way up. So it was, uh, it was tough hockey, man, playing 82 games like that and having to go back the next night, you know, kind of what, what was considered a concussion seeing stars. Cause every night I was seeing stars. Yeah. I had no idea. The first concussion that I actually sustained that was diagnosed. I was like, well, I think I've had more of these. 
you know, like actually seeing stars and being knocked out uh, for over a minute, laying there on the ice, you know, being up seven feet in the air and your hair, or your head bouncing off of the, off the ice for crying out loud. And then uh, the coach is like, get back out there. You know, it's yeah, like, cool. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, really yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, no wonder Sidney Crosby feels so good, <laughs> you know, props to him and his resilience. Oh my God. I remember me getting, uh, I got cross-checked from uh, Stan Neshkash, Neshkar here, and I got cross-checked into uh, Kevin Weeks. And Kevin Weeks actually got a concussion. He left the game. Are we talking about Kevin Weeks, the goaltender? Yeah, the goaltender. Yeah. I, I, I think I gave him one. He left the game. I ran into him so hard. I got hit from behind. I went in, got stitched up. I came back out and played. I remember being out there going, where am I? <laughs> There's no way I should have been back on the ice. Someone could have killed me. But well, Look at Paul Correa when he scored that goal against uh, New Jersey back in the day after getting hit by Stevens there. I mean, he was, uh, he was, he had snot bubbles coming out of his nose. He doesn't even remember going top shelf and scoring that goal. And apparently he doesn't remember two years of his life. I mean, he was going through depression, all kinds of stuff. I mean, Paul and I, you know, we, we, we grew up together in the same uh, community. My dad coached uh, Paul's younger brother. You know, our families were good friends growing up. Uh, um yeah. You know, and now he's just like, you know, so far removed from the game. You don't really hear about him too much. You know, he had the uh, the honor of, you know, making the, the, the Hall of Fame. Uh, I think it was two years ago. But, um, you know, I think, you know, he's one of those guys, too. He's, he's lucky enough where he's able to be like, you know, by the beach in the water. He really likes the flow and the energy of being on like a paddle board or whatnot. Um, but, yeah. you know, at one point, I mean, Paul Correa, in my mind, he's another guy in today's game that would just be, I mean, remind me a lot of Burray. Just yeah. unbelievable. Um, yeah, yeah. It's too bad that his career, I think his career would have been a lot more, I mean, it's not like he didn't have a successful career, but I mean, if he didn't take some of those blows to the head, you know, I mean, I think he would have been, you know, 130, 140 point man easy. I mean, he had a, a 200 point seasons back to back without really, a, I mean, he had Solani later on, but I mean, it was, he, the guy was an incredible hockey player. You played against him, you know. Yeah, he's, yeah, he, Another level, right? Those, Next level. Another level. So, yeah. Well, you had you. Your hands were just as good as him. So, in my humble opinion, I don't know. It was all, it was all yeah. that uh, stick handling before games with the orange hockey ball. That's right. <laughs> that was part of my pregame. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> yeah. So you're shaft and stuff. Yeah. So your uh, your success over in Europe was incredible, man. Uh, the style of play was more skill and finesse. Uh, was that more fun for you because you obviously played on the top lines over there and, uh, you know, yeah. obviously you didn't have that opportunity in the NHL. You had to adapt, which you did, but, uh, you know, tell me about your experience overseas. Was, was it more fun? Yeah. Well, yeah, well going over there, we'd, um, you know, each team has maybe four or five imports depending on the league you're in. Yeah. But I, I was fortunate enough to go to great organizations where the imports were great and we had the best kind of country players, you know, that wherever mm -hmm. you played. So, um, you know, the ice, ice surface is bigger over there. So you got a lot more room to make plays. Um, and I just happened to kind of, I went over there with confidence and, um, just went over to play my game and it really adapted to my, it was my style and I had, you know, successful, you know, obviously you can tell stats and won some championships with some great organizations and, uh, had, had a great journey being able to visit around the, you know, the world there. Amazing. Yeah. Awesome, man. Yeah. So how did the term Metro's office come into play? And I know it was compared to Gretzky's office. So um, the crowd said chance, especially for you and your unparalleled playmaking abilities. Um, I mean, I you're, you're a playmaker, man. I, I remember your vision was unbelievable. So I, I, I watched a lot of your highlights. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, Metro's office, I don't even came up with that, but I think it started in Finland. And I'll see you. Uh, I was always on the half wall kind of picking the, the box apart, you know, the, the penalty killers. So I think that's kind of where that, that came from. And that's always been kind of my, my specialty, I guess, is a power play, you know? And, um, yeah, that's kind of, that's where that started. So interesting. Yeah. And, and with a chance, yeah, they, they got songs for you over there. Like in, in Switzerland, they do, they're, they're singing songs. You know, I mean, that must have pumped you up. Yeah, it was great. It was great, man. Yeah, it's the atmosphere is um, if you watch like a, a football, soccer match over there, right? Yep. They're just, they're, they're, 
they're yelling the whole game and chanting. They got their the fan section where they they're always having a great time, waving flags. So um, great experience. That's awesome. So um, yeah, who was your favorite coach when you played uh, in the National Hockey League? Best coach that you ever had, as far as uh, you know, which gave you the most uh, confidence to go out there and play your game. Yeah, National Hockey League. I want to see it was uh, probably Claude Julian. You know the. Boston Bruins. When I, um, I in '06, I played um, at the World Championships, and he was uh, the penalty killer coach. And um, I got to have a good, good rapport with him, and uh, kind of went there, and he gave me a good role, and he was great for me. You know, um, in the minors, I got to say it was probably Glenn Hanlon. Glenn Hanlon, loved the guy. You know, after goalie got, for the old oh, goalie for the Canucks. Yeah, after I got sent down after my first game. You know, I thought that was the end of the world, right? I I reached, you know, I I played my one game and I was feeling sorry for myself for about a week. And he finally kind of snapped me out of it. And he taught me how to be a better pro. And, you know, don't don't worry about your last shift, you know, it's about your next shift. So um, it was that type of deal where, you know, working out, training, stretching, you know, he just, he he brought a lot of uh, how to be a good pro, you know, he taught me and um, thankful for a lot of coaches. Those are just two, two of the best that I've had. Right on. So let's hear all about you and your brother uniting after uh, his uh, certain mishap that happened. Um, I know it's a sensitive topic. If you want to elaborate on that, um, yeah. you know, that's uh, I, I definitely empathize with that because I've been in that situation myself. Um, yeah. Let's talk about that for a sec. You know, having a brother is a special thing. Yeah. Having a brother. Well, I mean, I can rewind it to growing up in and out of foster homes a little bit, you know, with the yeah. mom trying to you know, find our way a little bit, trying to keep us together all the time and having some hardships. But, um, you know, he, he was the kid that, you know, you got the good kids, bad kids growing up in inner city where all us hockey guys, we stuck together. And my brother, he didn't, he didn't really like sports. So he kind of veered to the, the bad kids, you know, and just started off, you know, stealing a candy bar or whatever from a store to eventually stealing cars to robbing, you know, the, the parking attendant, you know, whatever, that kind of stuff. And I um, remember getting a call in, um, I think it was 98, where it all went down. You know, I got a call from, you know, your brother's on TV. It was almost like the O.J. Simpson thing, you know, with the camera following the car. There was a manhunt for him. And I guess him and two of his uh, accomplices, they uh, followed the lawyer and his wife in a, a posh area of town, bumped him from behind and uh, took them hostage you know, um, beat them up for security coats for their house and went to their house and the husband escaped and got the police involved. And then, you know, obviously uh, you got the the charges that came after kidnapping, extortion, all whatever. And then while he was in there, you know, that, you know, that world, right. If someone says they're going to get you, you better get them first, I guess. And. Oh yeah. I've had guns put to my head. That's for sure. You know, that was, yeah. you know, the choice I made, uh, when hockey uh, didn't go well um, for certain situations with, you know, adversities with concussions and injuries and whatnot. And, um, you know, when I went down that road, it was, uh, it was dark, lost a lot of friends. It was either, you know, uh, prison, death or an addiction of some sort. And, uh, you know, I definitely had some destructive behavior patterns with addiction that I've overcome. Um, but I'll tell you what, you know, having your freedom taken away has got to be one of the most debilitating feelings and helpless feelings in the world that I've ever had to endure. Um, you know, the, the, the lack of, uh, you know, you feel the lack of self-worth and just everything that goes along with it is just, you know, you're, you're, you're a prisoner. Even, I had one guy in there actually that helped me out a lot. He said, he was an older guy. He said, just because you're in prison, Philly, it doesn't mean that you have to be prisoner of your own mind. And that kind of, you know, uh, it was like, he was like kind of my first mentor, so to speak, you know, beyond hockey, because, you know, other than, uh, you know, a few coaches that I had back before I I played junior when I left home at, when I just turned 16, which was way too young for me, I wasn't developed physically or mentally. I mean, I had the talent, but, you know, it was kind of getting thrown out to the wolves, right? And uh, you got all these big dreams ahead of you and aspirations and, um, yeah, it's kind of funny where your path leads. And I got when I when I ended up in a prison cell, that was the last place I thought I'd ever end up. It was uh, 
you know, very embarrassing for my family and, and whatnot. But, you know, what do you do? It's just like one of those things as you get older, it's like, you know, you learn from it and uh, you either change your life or, uh, you know, you go down, uh, down the darkness even more. And, you know, I'm still here. I'm still alive. So are you. So that means we still got a purpose and our, and our, our job's not done here on, on this planet. So it's, uh, it's all about giving back now. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, my, back to my brother. Yeah, he's been in here for a while. You know, it's uh, he's, he's back in there. I got to see him a few years ago when he got out. Um, and the, the bond wasn't really there. We didn't really grow up together, right? Because I was always moving around playing hockey and he was doing his thing. But I always thought, oh, man, I don't know how this is going to be when I see him, you know. But we reconnected. It was the best, man. I love him more than anything. But um, the choices he made, obviously, kind of got him where he's at. And Cause he's got fact. Yeah, he's got another year or two left, and um, we'll, we'll reconnect, you know, when that, that happy day comes. That'd be awesome, buddy. So, uh, at the end of the day, man, we're all humans, and life happens. Uh, it's how we respond to our adversity, you know, and turn those adversities into assets. Uh, so, what was your main driving force? You know, obviously going through adversities and whatnot, what was your driving force, you know, transmuting those adversities into assets, you know, that help fuel you feel the fire from within, so to speak. Good question. I think it was more of a, just wanting to keep on getting better and better. You know, it's kind of, it was instilled in me, you know, through the hockey, the hockey um, career, right. You kind of, uh, you got to just learn how to battle through stuff and um, compete and do what you got to do, right. To kind of keep moving forward. So yeah. Yeah. Hockey being such a mental game as well. You know, it's not always the easiest on your psyche, is it? No, no. Especially when you, when it's your livelihood, right? You know, you yeah. got to go, you got to perform and you, you can't, you, you got to do it. It's a business. And if you don't, if you don't do it, then you're, you're getting, you're getting yeah. sent down, you're getting sent down or cut or so it's survival, man. So uh, I've learned that at an early age to, you know, even practices, guys get sent down after practice. You got to, you got to compete every practice. So you can kind of relate it into life too, right? Yeah. Whatever you're doing in business, kind of put the work in, you know, and you'll get rewarded. Yeah. You're only as good as your last shift, right? Pretty much. Yeah. 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 So uh, what makes Metro's heart sing, buddy? What makes Metro's heart sing? Well, <laughs> I guess uh, it always goes to the family, I guess, right? The kids yeah. making sure they're okay and um, they're okay. And then the heart's singing. Um, nice. Besides me rapping in the, <laughs> the shower. <laughs> um, yeah, I just said, uh, you know, it, that, that's uh, it always goes to the family. Make sure they're doing good, right? And right. you're happy, so. Yeah, just giving your own happiness in abundance, right? Actually makes you happy, you know? Just goes to show kind of that we're all connected in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what is your me message to the world, to anyone that has a goal in life and what kind of mindset is needed to convert dreams into reality? Well, if you got the goal and you want it bad enough, um, you know, just you, you, nothing's easy, right? You got to work for it. So um, it's, it's kind of hard. Just, I don't really know what to say about that. Just basically, don't, don't ever give up, right? Keep, you're going to get knocked down, but you got to keep getting up. So just keep believing in yourself, right? Yeah, pretty much. The power of belief, <laughs> something that you had and something that you have and something that you continue to just keep going with. So I'm so proud of you, buddy. Um, when I look at you and what you've accomplished, even through the hard times, you always found a way to keep going. How challenging was that for you? And especially, you know, now, you know, life after hockey, let's talk about life after hockey, how, how the transition has been, you know, it's uh, not an easy go for uh, not just NHL hockey players, but for kids coming out of junior that don't, don't know what to do if they didn't go the scholarship route or whatever, you know, it's, you know, trying to find a purpose in life. You know, how tough has that been? Yeah, it's a, you know, you, you do 20 years of professional hockey and you go beyond that, you know, juniors and, growing up within a dressing room, you know, competing every night for a championship, for a goal, you know, having a schedule every day, right. Get in, stretch, mm -hmm. work out, skate, watch video, eat, sleep, play. And then all of a sudden, right. That's gone. I mean, I'm, I'm three years out now where I've adjusted, but as I can reflect, it, it was a hard little stage to go through 
after retiring and going back to a small little beach town where um, my ex is and the kids and trying to find my way without hockey was really, was a battle. So, um, but I'm in a good place now talking personally, but you just got to make sure you got a, a good support system. Absolutely. You know, that, that, right. You got to, and have enough, don't be afraid to reach out to anyone if you're feeling down or whatever. Right. So, yeah. That's the integral part about the show too. It's all about community and unity. You know, we want to, you know, you're our fifth guest. I'm so grateful to have you on, but um, you know, I think it's important that, uh, you know, the people that we have on this show is, you know, it's a platform where people can connect and be educated, you know, on not just mental health and psychology and sports and whatnot, because what you did and who you are are two separate entities. Riley and I were talking about that the other day. Uh, George and I talked about that the other day as well. Same with Robbie. And I mean, all our guests, you know, at the end of the day, we're just people. We're, we're, we're human beings. I know you love people. I love people too. You got a heart of gold, Metro. I know that you always have. And, um, you know, so it's... Uh, you know, your message in life for the kids, you know, coming up through the ranks, you know, uh, not taking yourself maybe too seriously, but still, you know, keeping your, you know, your trajectory and your focus on your goals and your dreams. You know, what do you, what do you think about that? I think about just uh, going back to what my mom said, treat people the way you want to be treated. Simple. But, um, you know, if it's a young hockey player, just it's all about your next shift, not your last shift. You know what I mean? That type of mentality, but it's the body language that coaches love to see, you know, be coming come to rink with enthusiasm, you know, it's just your life. Was, was there so, any, was there any coaches that you were scared of? Scared of? Yeah. Was there you any coach? I won't even go into it, but there's some yeah. coaches that they shouldn't have probably been coaching. <laughs> but, yeah. You know, we, we've all had those guys, but um, you all try to, you know, uh, push your button certain ways for myself. I, I needed a pat on the back, you know, not a kick in the ass. Yeah. You know, uh, that was my personality. Me too. Exactly. It's, uh, you know, motivation through not intimidation, uh, you know, inspire people through motivation, not intimidation, intimidating. Someone's not going to get them to play well, maybe some of the tough guys or whatever, but I know for players with uh, who's kind of sensitive or whatever, you know, especially a skilled hockey player, you're not going to get uh, many goals out of that kid when you're uh, trying to intimidate the crap out of them. I think that's changed a lot, you know, throughout the game, you know, the last two years, I think a lot of these, you know, kids are able to go out there and focus on their strengths. Um, you know, their coaches are good now, right? They, they realize yeah. the personalities they're dealing with. And that's uh, the culture is changing for sure. In the line of work that I'm in now doing coaching a few teams and do a player development and, being back in the hockey world, it's, uh, yeah, you get a lot more of a kid if you just kind of get down to his level and talk to him, pat him on the back, you know. And, and who doesn't want to feel good at the end of the day? Isn't it about making people feel good? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those things, though, too. I mean, you got to see how he reacts to it. Keeps on making a mistake, then maybe you got to try a different, <laughs> a, diff a different tactic. But for the most, most part, the kids I have now, it's, they're, they're all great kids and it's good. It's great, man. So what's your message to all the kids that come from similar beginnings that can learn from you? I always keep going back to the don't give up type of uh, attitude, but basically that's kind of where it all stems from, right? You, you, you got a dream or a goal. Um, you talk about a gratitude list. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I, every point <laughs> I get up, you have your gratitude list makes you feel better right away. Right. So, um, we can always find something to be grateful for. I always tell people, you know, people are always grateful when things are going good, but, but they're not when things are going a little bit bumpy is when I think it's the, the time to be the most great grateful for is like I'm grateful even when things are going a little bit kind of messy in my life, because they're not going to get better if you don't express that gratitude towards not just yourself, but towards other people as well. And people wear it on their face, you know, with anger and whatnot, even what's going on right now in the world. You know, I think that, you know, things could be softened up a little bit and a lot more, say, um, more comfort and optimism if people would just treat people kinder. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a crazy world out there right now, man. It is. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people, there's a lot of, you know, me people just for themselves and 
that's one thing I realized too, getting out in the real world after playing such a long career is that this, uh, it's a pretty cool world out there. There's great people, but it's, it's uh, it's not for the faint of heart, is it? But, <laughs> but that's what we got. We got to work with what we got. Yeah. <laughs> you doesn't have the choice. Change, doesn't change me. <laughs> no. Uh, you know, you're the same guy that I met 20 some odd years ago, buddy. Yeah. And don't ever change because who you are is, a, is an awesome person. I love you for who you are. Thank you, Philly. So what's next for Metro in his life? You know, all over the map is obviously a platform that we get real stories out to the world that impact people and show the humanism behind uh, the so-called glamour. Uh, I know you give 100% into giving back. How does that look moving forward? I know you talked about, you know, these different platforms that you're working with. Just know that this platform is a community to support anything that people are doing to make a contribution. Yeah, what I'm doing now, though, uh, back to, you know, I got the, the Metro Method where I'm doing player development, mentoring the, the young kids, you know, giving them pointers what I've been through, you know, uh, helping them become better players especially better young men. Right. So, yep. um, doing that, I'm in a great, great place here. I'm down in Tampa. You know, I'm doing some work with the lightning, um, learn to play program, um, start how up. St a how stoked were you when they won the Stanley cup finals this past year? Yeah, it was I, awesome. I, I mean, I know there was no fans in the stands and it must've been a little bit kind of weird. I know it was weird watching, but, yeah. uh, you know, Seeing a guy like Steven Samko's uh, hoist the cup there for the first time, you know, it must have been pretty cool, emotional. I saw you had uh, your Instagram live going on. You're like, this is amazing, or whatever. So I felt like I was kind of there for a minute. It was pretty cool watching it through you. Yeah, my uh, my girlfriend and I, we went to, uh, they had the big river walk, or um, they had, obviously, I don't know if you saw footage, but they're on the, the channel side, going up in boats with the Stanley Cup, and then they got off, took a trolley to the big stadium. Uh, where the Bucks play uh, Raymond James Stadium, and um, it was a great, great celebration. But um, you know, that's it, it was such a hard trophy to win this year. Those guys being in a bubble for sixty-five days, not seeing a family or member, or, you know, no fans. I want to talk about raw emotion and passion for sport? Seeing those guys block shots. And oh, it was amazing. Just pure yeah. raw, with no fans, no cheering. It was, it was great to see. The hockey was phenomenal. Yeah, I thought it was uh, it was actually next level hockey. I mean, some of the skill set that came out was, uh, yeah. I mean, it was different. You still hear about the injuries that guys are playing through, you know, like a torn labrum, um, sagging. You know, it's just the You know, he's out for five months now or four months. It's just what guys endure for that cup. You know, you got to win. You got to win sixteen games. Yeah. Well, I mean, you won a you won a championship over overseas. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so you know what it's like to go all the way and, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the playoffs are a whole different game than uh, the regular season, aren't they? Yeah. Every, everything, every mistake that you make, every play is so heightened, you know, it's just everything, um, everything is at another level. So I've been yeah, fortunate enough to be on some good teams. You know, I won a, you know, the championship in, uh, Lugano, uh, Switzerland where, you know, I had Billy Pelton in. Played yep. NHL, New, New Milan, defenseman, um, Jason York, another guy who played in Ottawa. But right. great support cast, but you just realize what these are going to be your friends forever type deal, you know, these guys you win a cup with. So I've won two, and the journey's great with a bunch of guys in the dresser and going for one goal. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, any last words before we have you back on the show again? I don't know, man. I guess uh, the work that you're doing for everyone, I'm, I'm so um, thankful for you having me on here. And if anyone needs to reach out to me, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm no doctor, but I, I, I'm here to talk to, you know, if anyone's going through any stuff, because uh, it's not easy out there. It's not. And so uh, how can we follow you there, Mets? Uh, obviously, you're on Instagram at uh, Glen uh, Metropolit Metro. Uh, uh, Metro or, um, you know, the Metro method, you know, it's, uh, that's Instagram um yeah that's pretty much my only platform right now and, you know as i'm growing here so yeah i can see your hair is growing uh really fast you, you see uh, that yeah it's really nice it's coming you, good yeah you're inspiring me to shave my noodle today well, 
<laughs> looking good, man. I wouldn't do that. Hold on to it as long as you can. I'm gonna, I don't know. I got a little bit left there. So we'll see if, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, throw some fertilizer on it a little later today. There you go. Peanut butter solution. Absolutely. Grow green hydroponics. <laughs> Anyways, uh, sure appreciate of having you on here, buddy. And uh, we lo look forward to hearing uh, from you soon. And, uh, you know, we obviously stay in contact. So um, thank you so much for coming on to All Over the Map. Thanks for having me, Philly. Right on, Great. brother. Keep up the good work, brother.